to the today's webinar. Uh, the topic is microservice instrumentation with Zipnish. Um, it's uh, currently, I think, uh, like uh, 75 seconds past three. Uh, so we will be taking it a bit slow for the next minute or so while we sort of wait for the stragglers to, to show up. Um, yes. So um, we can start off uh, by, by by some introductions. So I'm the guy on the left, left there. My name is Per Bur or Per Bur or something like that. I work as the CTO of, in Bunny Software and with me here today is Marius. Yes, uh, hi, uh, I'm Marius. I'm, I'm part of the team that has developed uh, Zipnish. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the topic for today will be sort of uh, walking through uh, the sort of background for the product, how the product uh, came around, what its architecture, and then we're going to try to do a little demo uh, to sort of uh, give you a feeling for, for how this could be set up. So let's sort of talk, introduce the sort of uh, concept a bit, uh, talk a bit about microservices. I mean, most of you have a good idea of what it was, what it is, but but just so we were on the same page. Uh, so I mean, it's been an application pattern it's been used for quite quite uh, a lot for the last five, four or five years, I would say. Uh, I mean the. One of the core ideas is you reduce complexity by having small, uh, small s services that are relatively simple. And as you might or may might not know, uh, software is as you sort of add complexity, uh, develop a development time increases exponentially. And you can sort of just do sort of. I think like varnish three to varnish four. Uh, I think that took uh, three years. Uh, and if you compare that to varnish zero or nothing to varnish one zero, oh, that I think took uh, like nine months. Uh, and it's obvious that in the first nine months of development, we added a lot more functionality than than we did in the three years it took from varnish three to varnish four. Uh, so because you have to take the existing complexity into consideration. So of course, so one of the, I think like for me, one of the, the key motivations for, for microservices is, is to increase development velocity. Uh, yeah, a sort of property of microservices is that you get a distributed application. That's not necessarily a good thing, but uh, you get it anyway. Uh, it's also considered a loose collection of RESTful APIs, uh, one or more applications running on the same or in the same sphere. Uh, a lot of people are leveraging microservices on like heterogeneous platforms. So you have some .NET and some Java mixed together, uh, and you can have sort of yeah, and that of course means that you can sort of pick your tools, uh, so you can do the performance intensive stuff in Java and you can do the non-performance intensive stuff in Ruby or, or whatever it is that you sort of prefer for that. Uh, and of course that means that you can sort of, if you have something that's very well suited for implementation in Lisp, you can even have some Lisp in there maybe. Probably, in, yeah, you should probably not do that. <laughs> um, Typically, sort of each service has its own infrastructure. That, I mean, that's not really sort of a well-defined rule, but a lot of the implementations out there uh, have that each service has its own database, so that it's it's able to sort of it's it's more a bit more resilient. Uh, and the services are typically synchronous, so that means that that all the the API calls, they're blocking API calls. Uh, there's theoretically nothing wrong with with making them asynchronous, but I, I haven't ever seen of anyone actually doing that. Um, so of course, this the application stack on each service can of course be synchronous. So there's nothing wrong with new, using Node for microservices, and probably that's quite common. Uh, but uh, between the services, they tend to sort of block on each other's calls. Uh, 
yeah, rather than uh, doing callbacks. So typically, sort of uh, when you see uh, yeah a client here connecting to a microservice uh, called Foo, it does some sort of call. What typically we see is that Foo will look up uh, the service that it needs to dial in the service directory, that's etcd or whatever it is that you choose. I think there are three or four alternatives now. Uh, and then it will sort of connect to bar, uh, and then bar might need to call another microservice, and it connects to zoo after looking up where a zoo lives in the, in the service directory. And then zoo will talk to Baz after, again, looking up in the service directory, and then sort of uh, so in, in this example, this is about as deep as the call stack goes. And then Baz will respond to Zoo, and Zoo will respond to Bar, and, and Bar will respond to Foo, and Foo will then be able to fulfill the request with a response back to the client. So uh, now we've, we've seen sort of varnish deployed in this sort of, uh, in this sort of architecture. And it's uh, talk a bit more about, uh, ab about that, because on the previous slide, there was basically no room to deploy Varnish. Uh, so we have a customer, actually it's sort of a local customer here in Norway. Uh, it's a news conglomerate called Amedia. Uh, back in 2008, they, they redesigned their CMS. I think they actually started a bit before that. Um, but they, they basically decided on a microservice architecture. And this was before the term microservices was sort of in widespread use. So they didn't really refer to it as microservices, but it was basically microservices. And one of the key goals that they had uh, was that these services, they were supposed to be stateless. They, they really wanted stateless microservices. And of course, it, the gain in having stateless microservices is that, or st any stateless service, is that stateless services are quite easy to debug compared to uh, services that have state. Because basically, if you can capture the input data and you, and then sort of, the, if the output data is wrong and that would be a bug, then reproducing that is typically just about re-entering the input data. And if this, the, the service is truly stateless, then that bug will manifest it, itself every time. You don't have these bugs that whenever it's past 3 o'clock and the sort of neighbor's cat is, is somehow in the building, uh, the service fails. Uh, yeah. But of course, with statelessness, there's a, a performance penalty. Uh, there's a reason why why most applications aren't stateless, and that's because in, in a stateless service, you can't cache anything. So uh, what their solutions for that was basically to stick Varnish in the middle and have Varnish do the caching. Uh, so that basically removed the need for internal caching, for application-specific caching. There are uh, I mean, there's a there's a there's an upside and a downside to that. Uh, the upside, of course, is that they now had one single place where they needed to do cache invalidations. Um, so, if you imagine having like a hundred services and every each each one of them having its own cache, and if you then need to invalidate some piece of data from these hundred services, every one of those services has to have like a cache invalidation API. Uh, and then you, of course, need to talk to every one of them and sort of make sure that you remove all the invalidated bits from that service. And of course, just sort of, uh, you can imagine sort of most time, a lot of time would be sort of spent in actually debugging the, the, the cache invalidation layer of their application. And so they were very eager to get rid of that. Uh, the downside to sort of uh, having the, the cache be sort of external to the API is that, that even though Varnish would be on the same local area network, uh, so a cache hit would be just uh, probably half a millisecond away, 
that's still half a millisecond, which in sort of computing terms is quite long compared to, say, a memory access, which is typically me measured in nanoseconds. So that's like six orders of magnitude. Uh, but it, yeah, so that it depends on sort of if this is suitable, depends on sort of how data intensive it is. Of course, you, you probably shouldn't do sort of huge matrix. Uh, operations uh, by sort of fetching every data point uh, uh, over the network. That would be not ideal. Um, yes. So what they built was uh, looked something like this. So they would have all these microservices uh, and they would stick Varnish in the middle and then they would all be sort of connected to Varnish. And then as Foo needs to talk to Bar, it will just talk to Varnish. Varnish will then connect it to Bar because it knows where Bar is. Uh, uh, and then they could talk to each other. And Varnish would retain a copy of the response from Bar. Uh, so if it's possible to sort of reuse that response, of course, then, and then that response would be reused. And you would have a cache hit. And of course, that means that instead of 75 milliseconds of processing time, you get half a millisecond uh, of processing time by retrieving the cache head. Um, yeah, and all these, yeah, all these services will then talk to each other through one. Uh, so to some of the gains, oh, oh, let's see. Uh, this allows for stateless microservices, which again makes debugging a lot easier. Uh, centralizing cache and caching validation. So, I mean, caching validation is the hard bit of this. Implementing a cache in every application is probably not that hard, but uh, but uh, um, making the invalidation same is probably the the, the hard bit. Uh, it also me meant that they would add resiliency and, and monitoring. So. <clears throat> The traditional way of implementing microservices with each microservice being responsible for uh, talking to other microservices, compare that to the architecture they had. It's a bit like comparing uh, like TCP, I think, versus X25, which was at some point the alternative to TCP IP, uh, where in TCP IP, the sort of one of the sort of properties of that protocol is that the responsibility of uh, almost everything is at the endpoints. So the endpoint is 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 needs to make sure that it's pair that it's, it gets all the packages. Needs to track everything and sort of uh, there's no there's very little intelligence in 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 the network itself. Whereas with, with X25, uh, the client can just sort of send a packet into the network and the network is respons uh, responsible for sort of making sure that it arrives at the destination. So with with the setup that Amy did, uh, the, the, each microservice would then just talk to Varnish. Varnish would be responsible for finding, so if, if, if it needs to talk to Foo, Varnish will need to find a version, a server, a service that runs foo and that's available. So Varnish would use its, its probes to, to do health checks on the microservices. It would leverage the load balancing that's sort of built into Varnish. So Varnish uh, would distribute load on each microservice. So if there's a very busy microservices service, they might add five instances and then they put it into a director and then Varnish will of course uh, load balance between those directors. Um, you could leverage things in VCL to do things like if a connection fails, it could retry with, with another uh, server in that director. So that would be using uh, features like saint mode to sort of uh, add resiliency uh, to the setup. In addition, there's this, there's this built-in sort of monitoring capability because if, if a connection fails, you have the act and the option to run some VCL and to actually take some sort of action. Uh, so what that action is, of course, depends on, on sort of how much you want to stick into that one instance. But but you have the possibility to to as each as an as a, as as if foo serve uh, if foo fails to 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 respond to to a single uh, API call, 
you have the ability to do something with it there, whether that is sending some sort of UDP packet, uh, logging or doing a curl call, whatever it is that you want to do, you have the possibility to do something right there and then instead of waiting for something to sort of uh, parse the logs and do something at, at, a, uh, at a later point. You have that the, the, the possibility there. Uh, yeah, so as I said, uh, their setup they would be able to simplify the endpoints. Uh, they would also eliminate their service catalog. Now this the last point there is probably was a bigger point back in 2008 than it is today uh, because service catalogs back then weren't really as mature as they are now. So now maybe sort of etcd and, and the others, they're, they're quite mature products. Uh, I wouldn't sort of deem the risk of, of, of deploying one of them to, to being really that, that big. Yes, uh, they, they were stuck with one one problem though, and that's profiling microservices, and that's that's hard or quite hard, uh, harder actually, uh, spe specifically profiling them in in production. So instead of instead of 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 having one JVM or one server to monitor for traffic to a specific service, you now need to have forty, and uh, out of those forty, like. 20 of them might be involved in answering a single API call. So you have, you, you're spending 5 milliseconds on one server, 7 milliseconds on another server, 20 milliseconds on, on, on one server, and, and then that, that, that becomes uh, problematic. So let's say that this is your, your call stack here. I just made up some, some uh, function names. So we have this function called page composer. And that talks to uh, some title service. Title service responds in 30 milliseconds. Then the page composer talks to the article database. Uh, article database talks to the author service to see, I don't know, figure out how old the author is or whatever. Uh, that responds in 10 milliseconds. And then the article database talks to the corrections database and see if are there any corrections for this article that takes 40 milliseconds and then the article the uh, service responds to the page composer uh, and it has taken 55 milliseconds so you can see that out of those 55 milliseconds uh, 50 are spent waiting for the other services and 5 milliseconds are spent on on, on uh, Process, processing it internally. Now, uh, let's say that you have this in production and then uh, something happens. Uh, there's a memory leak in the correctional, uh, corrections uh, service. Uh, so that one spikes in, it, it starts running really, really slow. So instead of 40 milliseconds, it starts responding in 250 milliseconds. So that means that Page Composer will now suddenly have 210 milliseconds extra latency added to it. And sort of looking at it from the outside, you just see this spike, like from 98 to, to uh, uh, 308 uh, milliseconds. And you need to figure out why that is happening. And if it's something as, as easy to spot as one of the JVMs being low memory, that's fine. But it might be something a bit more subtle than that. So maybe the correction database uh, only responds slow on 3% of the API calls. Then you have a situation that might be really tricky to figure out. You need to figure out then, then where that delay is coming from. And that, in a distributed service, that that's can be uh, tricky. Specifically, if you have like five different architectures and hundred hundreds of servers, so uh, this was basically the uh, where Signish came in. So at this point, uh, when our media was sort of confronted with the, with this, uh, they considered the Sipkin uh, project, which is built by Twitter to solve exactly this thing. Uh, it uses some Java modules to sort of, uh, I think, some JVM, some 
filters uh, to sort of add uh, and collect data from uh, from the JVMs, and then it sort of pushes it into Cassandra, and there's a web UI that sort of visualizes the data. Uh, I made a disqualified Sipkin because of Cassandra, because I think they thought Cassandra was a pain in the ass to to sort of set up and maintain, and at some point that I think was was true. Cassandra was a bit of a painful thing to to run. Uh, so basically, what it did was to re-implement Sipkin without Cassandra, um, and then at a later point, as they sort of ran into performance problems, they decided to move to Sipkin anyway because actually Sipkin performs quite well, uh, and one of the reasons why Sipkin performs quite well is because of Cassandra. Uh, so at this point, we have we sort of met with them a number of times, and uh, at some point, somebody asked the question: Why why can't instead of like collecting these data? Like having uh, modify these hundreds of, of of microservices, why don't we collect these data from Varnish? Because the data flows through Varnish anyway. Because as you remember, these guys were not doing a traditional microservice installation; they were running uh, microservices on top of Varnish. So, and Varnish would then know it will know uh, every, the timing of every request and response. So that led to sort of Sipnish being uh, initiated. Uh, the architecture, I think, some sort of contrasted to Sipkin, is quite simple. Uh, there's a bit that sort of reads the log. Varnish is, so Varnish logs. I don't know how 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 well you guys know Varnish, but but Varnish doesn't have like a log file. It has an area of shared memory that is sort of logs continuously. So it's log sort of log a, a log stream. And, and since it's memory, it's very fast. So you can write to memory really, really, really quite fast compared to how fast you can write to a file. It also means that the file, since this is, is done in a circular manner, varnish logging doesn't sort of run out, make you run out of disk. So um, what we did was to write an application that would read the log and to, to sort of extract the data we want and then stick that in the MySQL database. Uh, we picked MySQL mostly because it's simple, available, and everywhere. Uh, and it sort of performs quite well. Uh, and yeah, so that was the log collecting bit. And then we, 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 we wrote a web application in Flask, which is a sort of Python, one of these modern uh, toolkits to write web applications. Uh, and then we sort of, and then basically that meant that we had replicated, I think like 95% of the functionality in Sipkin by using these rather simple, uh, simple tools. So architecture, it, it it looks a bit like this. So there's there's Varnish, which as you remember, typically sort of sticks in the middle of of all the microservices. Varnish has what we refer to as the VSL, the Varnish Shared Log. So that's the shared memory log. Um, and that's consumed by the log reader. The, that, of course, parses the log, extracts the data that it wants, and outputs that to MySQL. And then sort of the web UI comes along and sort of reads the content from the MySQL database and presents these nice, I don't know, graphs, column graphs. Yeah, you, you, yeah, you could potentially call them graphs. Yeah, you could potentially call them graphs. Yes, yes. Uh, so there are, in order for this whole thing to work, there are a couple of things that sort of need to change. Uh, to the uh, requests and responses as they pass through uh, through Varnish. Basically, the only sort of the, the point of all these changes is that. Um, if you re recall that uh, if if service foo gets an API call and it needs to talk to bar, varnish doesn't know why foo is talking to bar. It needs to understand why. Uh, it needs to understand that that foo talks to bar because it needs to fulfill a certain request. So this is so so that we could group these requests together because uh, let's say 
request number five, which comes to foo, needs foo to talk to bar to fulfill that. So that will be request number six. So there's a dependency on uh, from request number five to request number six. So five cannot be fulfilled until, of course, because it's synchronously blocking until uh, foo gets an answer from bar. So that six is fulfilled. So in order to do this, uh, we basically do two things. Uh, we add, uh, we have the parent ID. So that's called X varnish parent uh, is added to every request. So as sort of uh, foo gets request number five. In the request it does to bar, it will add an X varnish parent that will indicate that this is a sub request of request five. So there's a relationship here. In addition, there is what's referred to as X varnish trace, which is basically the ID of the initial request into the microservice architecture. The point of that is basically so that the web UI, when it needs to visualize this, can get all the spans, all the sub-requests in one uh, database query, instead of doing what would be, I think, a breadth first search. So, because it could do without it, but then it would have to do, like, give me all the requests that have request number five as a parent and then it would get back six, and then it would need to ask again, give me all the requests that have six as a parent, and then it will might get three, and then you will have to sort of search through all these. And instead of that, there's an optimization in place so that give me all the requests that are associated with initial request number five, and then the database will re return all of them, and yeah, there, you avoid a lot of back and forth. Uh, so that's th these are the changes basically that you need to do to the microservices in order to sort of leverage this. So we can sort of have a look at the, uh, some of the uh, HTTP as as it sort of flows through. Um, so the the, the 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 details here will depend are a bit application specific. Uh, there might be some variance here depending on you might or might not want the clients on the outside to talk to Varnish. You might want to have this microservices architecture purely on the inside and that there's a API service that's sort of responsible for talking to all the clients. So let's say that the service is Baz and and it doesn't it's it, it's not connected to to directly through Varnish so the client request will actually get directly to Baz. So then there's basically, it just needs to look like this. So this is the complete basic uh, uh, HTTP request. Uh, then, of course, Baz needs to talk to Foo. Uh, so the request will look like this. And here we've already added uh, a couple of, of request headers. So we added the parent request, which was basically the ID of the of the that was assigned to the initial request. If that request went through Varnish, it will, of course, get that ID automatically through sort of the X Varnish header, which will be used uh, uh, as a basis for these IDs. If not, it, you need to modify the service internally just to sort of assign an ID. Uh, yeah. So it needs to add uh, a parent. So this request is the sub-request of request 6382. Um, it also belongs in the trace 6381. So 6381 would be sort of the initial uh, initial ID of, of the first uh, uh, request. Yeah. Yeah, the, there's a slight semantic error here uh, because this would be actually the third third request here. Uh, and I, pre I present it as a second, but no matter. Uh, yeah, oh, I highlighted them. Yeah, so that, that's apparent and that's the trace. 
So it's, you, as you can see, it's sort of it's reasonable, reasonably simple. The responses are even simpler. I mean, they uh, they don't necessarily have to have any any uh, uh, modifications to them at all uh, because the log reader will look for these headers in either the requests or the responses. Uh, so it's a lot easier to just sort of modify the requests. Uh, then you don't have to worry about the responses at all. Uh, but if it's um, impossible to modify the request, it, you could also uh, modify the response and add uh, things like the trace ID there instead. Uh, yeah, this is a link to the GitHub page. And next on the agenda will Marius, who will do a little demo. Yes, I will pick it up from here. Yeah. Right. So um, the purpose uh, of this demo is uh, is to show you guys um, how to uh, how to set up uh, uh, how to set up uh, Zipnish, how to edit uh, how, how to edit your, uh, your your VCL, and how to make your application uh, visible for uh, for, uh, for Zipnish. In this uh, in this uh, test setup, I have three virtual machines. First one uh, is a CentOS machine that will host Varnish uh, and Zipnish. The second one is a is a is a virtual machine hosting a MySQL instance, and the third one is a, is a VM hosting the UI. Uh, we'll pretty much uh, focus on uh, on the one that hosts uh, Varnish and Zipnish. So. For simplicity reasons, I have uh, installed all the all the required packages uh, in, in in beforehand. You can see a list of them on our Zipnish uh, uh, GitHub page. Also, I have already installed uh, Zipnish and Varnish, so we can see that both of them are uh, running. So. Yeah, because there's RPMs at the GitHub page. Yeah, mm. uh, the packages are already there. We do have packages for CentOS and uh, Debian. Yeah. So log reader is up and running and also you should see that varnish should be up and running. Yes, it should be there. Yes. Uh, <coughs> uh, before moving any uh, any further, I will just show you the uh, the VCL of my varnish instance. Which is an extremely simple, uh, <laughs> an, an extremely simple VCL. Again, for demonstration purposes, it, it works perfect. Yeah. So uh, the only thing I, I did here was to add a default backend and see here this port. This is the port on which um, my demo, yeah, my demo Python server uh, will uh, will live. Yeah. So I mean, I need to point out that this is not really microservices you're talking about no, here because no. it's it's one service uh, that sort of talks HTTP, uh, so and it really runs on on just a single server. If you were to sort of do this in a, a dev the development environment, you would need some routing to sort of route the requests back and forth and, and some other things. Correct. Yeah. So it's a microservice architecture consisting out of one service only. Yeah. But we one will... medium-sized service. Exactly. Not really micro. <laughs> <laughs> we will try to replicate the behavior. Though. So uh, we don't I, have. Yeah. Yeah. No, I just point, uh, point out. I mean, uh, I don't, again, I don't know how how well you guys know Varnish, but I mean, uh, uh, both the Varnish book, uh, which is available on the website, and the official varnishcache.org documentation, uh, should give you uh, some insights into how to sort of configure Varnish if you have want to have multiple services. You want the sort of the routing to be based. It can be based on virtual host. It can be based on URL path. Uh, it can be based on 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 where your neighbor's cat is. I mean, there's uh, all sorts of op options uh, to to set up the routing. Yeah. So there we go. We've got uh, our VCL configured. Uh, next next thing I should probably show you a little bit on how. Uh, our Python server will behave, and that's very briefly described here. So the, uh, this Python server will simply expose one endpoint that is called API v1 get all. In order for uh, get all endpoint to fulfill a request, uh, 
it will need to it, it will need to do further requests to one two three four five six seven and as many endpoints it requires in order to fulfill the request. So this Python server will only have one endpoint available. Right. Um, yeah, but each of those will be uh, HTTP so calls, right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So there are uh, at least a couple of HTTP methods, uh, HTTP um, API endpoints here. Yeah. So if we are to look on how the actual server implementation looks like, it, it is a very it is a very uh, naive and simple implementation, but for demonstration purposes, it's uh, it is there. So mm -hmm. this is uh, these are the basic configurations for it. It will uh, it will live on uh, below the 999 port as we have configured in in our VCL. And I'm I also need to specify the port under which varnish will uh, uh, under which varnish is being configured because of the subsequent calls. Remember yeah. that all of these calls will have to go through varnish. Yeah. In order to pick up the required uh, headers. Yeah, but that's basically just an application specific thing because exactly it would yeah. in in uh, on a regular setup it would just use a, a virtual host which would resolve to your host which runs varnish and then it will um, and then it would default to port 80 and yeah so that right. yeah, I just uh, I think I might interrupt with a, there's a question from uh, Raphael um, yes. if it's sort of mandatory to use varnish with sifnish or if it's possible only to use sifnish so yeah uh, it actually is mandatory to use uh, varnish because uh, the whole architecture is, is built on varnish uh, all the data that we're fetching, the, that we're fetching in the log reader, are fetched from Varnish log. Yeah. And Varnish log lives on top of Varnish. Yeah. So, so Raphael, I mean, one of Varnish's strength is the ability to log a ton of data, and and uh, Zipnish basically leverages Varnish's logging capabilities. There's, as you saw, like the minimum configuration is very minimal. It doesn't really need to be complex. You don't need to do any caching. You don't need to do uh, any any modification of the the services in Varnish itself. If you just want Sepnish, but but having just a minimum Varnish installation there is a I would say the cost of that is is relatively small in terms of complexity. Yeah, sorry right. about that. Let's continue. Uh, I'll continue a little bit and uh, as. Uh, as Per has told earlier, there are some changes that you need to do in your application. So let's imagine that this is actual one of your application that uh, handles uh, some GET request. Mm -hmm. You'll just need to make sure that uh, you're passing along further on your next request these uh, these headers. And this here, this is just a simple logic, uh, the one that I have uh, highlighted earlier, in order to tell, okay, these are the headers that I'm interested in, and the ones that I'm uh, interested in, in passing them further. Uh, uh, these are the ones that will be picked up by Varnish log and further by, by the log reader. Uh, the, this entire example is to be found uh, on our Zipnish uh, uh, GitHub pages. So again, this is uh, just a simple server that handles uh, GET requests and will pretty much have uh, one uh, endpoint available. So uh, at this point, we do have our log reader up and running. We do have our varnish set up, and uh, we do have some, uh, uh, and we do have a simple uh, web, a simple web application running. In order to have all these uh, components handshaking, I'm just going to run a small uh, unit test that will start uh, issuing uh, some requests toward uh, towards this uh, server. And we'll see that uh, all the all the timings need, needed to, to fulfill the request to one, two, three, four, and and all these uh, subsequent uh, endpoints will be visible under uh, afterwards in the UI. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some I have added some um, some random timeouts between the subsequent calls. That's okay. in order to yeah. highlight that hey, this this is the amount of time that it's needed between the subsequent calls. So. I'm just going to open the log test. Um, right, uh, this is a uh, this is a brief configuration of 
uh, of my unit test here. So uh, again, you see that all these all the requests will be done uh, uh, will be done uh, through through the uh, through Varnish. Yeah. So the initial uh, API call also happens through Varnish. Correct. Okay. All right. So this may take a few seconds here due to the random timeouts. Yeah. Shouldn't take that long though. Right. So what we have seen here is uh, what has happened is that throughout this test, uh, we have issued a, a request towards get all. Yeah. But in order for get all to uh, to respond, it needs to make subsequent calls to one, two, three, four, and so on. Yeah. So we will switch now to the UI in order to see how, uh, what has happened. Yeah, remember that, that that's true for almost all logs, uh, that they are logged in uh, in the order which the transaction finishes. Ooh. That came along fast. My emails. Right. Oh, so this is uh, this is the, the unit test that uh, Yeah. All, so. all this data uh, all these data that we see here, these timings, uh, these are the ones that have been produced by uh, the request made through the unit test. Yeah. So we can we can see that the first re the request that we did towards get all has taken in total five seconds, uh, a bit over five seconds. If yeah. if you see in the right uh, top corner, yeah, five point two seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, so which was the longest? Which was I would probably say the request to endpoint number six, probably. Yeah, it took almost one second. Yeah, so you click on the span to get this, uh, to yeah. get the timing information. Yeah. 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 So uh, based on this. And these, yeah. these are all. Uh, yeah, these are all. Can you sort them here? No. No. Okay. Or at least. I'm not aware of uh, <laughs> sorting. Yeah. yeah, we might want to add some sorting so we could sort of, uh, because there's a, uh, yeah, dependencies here which are, are, are kind of hard to, harder to spot than, than you would see otherwise. So if we should run this unit test again, these, uh, these timings should change because, yeah, uh, we've got some random uh, sleep time in between. Mm. So probably the total duration will change and the times of, uh, of each uh, of these calls will change. So we could probably give it a shot again. So you could sort of imagine this sort of in a, in a sort of production environment. Uh, so currently sort of we estimate that this current architecture should be able to log somewhere uh, between 1,500 and 2,500 API uh, calls per second. Uh, of course, that 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 sort of your mileage may may vary uh, due to a lot of factors. How many CPUs you have, uh, how good you are at tuning MySQL, uh, etc. Et, 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 et so you sort of you may want to sort of if trace everything, or you may want to to uh, to trace one in ten uh, initial uh, root calls. Uh, or, or, or and then sort of you might want to add some sort of filters and and, uh, and stuff to the to the to the database in order to find the the, the deviant uh, traces. Right. So if you remember the previous uh, the previous test has yielded 5.2 seconds yeah, for the time score. Now we have 5.4. So now you can see the, the the timings are a bit different. Yeah. So if you're interested on what has happened on, on a specific request, you will just click on it and you can see what has happened between the, the client requests, the server handling and so on. So between the, the time that the server has received the, uh, the request and has uh, sent it back, it took maybe 900 milliseconds. So that was pretty much the sleep time for yeah. this specific uh, request. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Was that uh, the whole demo? Uh, yes, that was pretty much it. Uh, mm -hmm. One thing I would uh, I would like to point out is uh, in your uh, 
in your log reader and UI components configuration, uh, the main the main point that glues them uh, together is um, is the MySQL configuration. Yeah. So uh, if we were to check the configuration of uh, the log reader, you will see that uh, I'm pointing out to to a virtual machine hosting, hosting my MySQL database. And it is the same host, the database name, username, and password that you will have to pass in your UI configuration. Yeah, and that's the last application? Correct. And that is, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, yeah, good. Yeah. I think uh, we, we might uh, want to do some questions. Uh, yes, I guess yeah. we could. Yeah. So, uh, first one from uh, Peter Steiner. Uh, if Varnish is in the middle of multiple microservices, would you recommend running one Varnish D process or one per microservice? Uh, generally, I would I would run one. You you pretty much have one. Yeah. Uh, Zipnish would sort of no have no issues with you having multiple. Uh, but generally, sort of the fewer components you have in your stack, the better. Uh, and I mean, Varnish is typically not the limiting factor when it comes to performance. Uh, so, so I mean, one Varnish server should easily do 10,000 uh, HTTP calls per second. Uh, and and if it, it, if it would turn out that Sipnish would be the sort of limiting performance factor, that would not actually impact the performance of your APIs. Uh, so the architecture here is quite neat because the Varnish logging itself is asynchronous. So Varnish D will log to shared memory and then the log reader will pick that up. And if that log reader can't keep up with the, 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 the log, that's basically its problem. It's sort of so it's, we basically isolated it from the sort of performance critical path here. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Rafael's questions are already answered. Uh, Vlad Russo, uh, this only work if we expose API calls by making relative calls. What happens if half of the calls my app need to make are service side? calling the API directly. So uh, I, what I'm guessing here is that that you that you are making some calls that are not going through Vanish. Yeah, that, that would be my understanding as well. Yeah. But, uh, if, if these calls are not going through Vanish, then yeah, of course, uh, we won't be able to track them. Yeah. So I mean, you could then modify <laughs> your API to sort of insert those spans into the database directly, but that would sort of, you're getting to the point there where you are are, are de defeating the, the purpose. Uh, basically, I mean, uh, you, you could use Zipnish in, in without running Vanish and we're just logging directly to the database, but that, that, that would basically turn it into Zipkin. Uh, the the point here, of course, is to 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 leverage all the knowledge that Varnish has about the the microservice traffic, and to sort of uh, to to give you some some uh, insight uh, based on that. Uh, oh, there's a bunch of questions. <laughs> this question is from Sandeep. Uh, if one need to include this in an existing application, all the service code needs to be modified to add the request headers, right? Yeah, that's yes. correct. Yes. And that, that was one of the reasons why we went ahead with this, because we thought that if we have to tailor, if somebody has to tailor their microservice application and to do significant changes to it in order to, to deploy it, nobody would use this. But since the, the, the changes are very, they're not very invasive, you just need this basically this this one header uh, or two headers then that's uh, that's uh, that's quite not uh, uh, that's what's the opposite of invasive yeah the opposite <laughs> of invasive <laughs> uh, next question is from Cassius uh, MySQL login credential you must you just mentioned in the sickness 
CFG, G and UI CFG. Can you explain that again? Why we're pro providing the credential twice? Uh, yes. Uh, the first time we're providing the, the credentials are in the log reader component. That's, that's the component that will write data into the MySQL database. The second time we do it, we do it in the UI component, that's the flash cap, and that's the time when we read from the database. Yes. And since these are, these are two separate components, one needs to write, the other one needs to read. Yeah, so you can imagine having two Varnish uh, servers uh, sort of in your Zipkin installation. Uh, Zipnish, so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, of course, then you'd have one log reader on each, uh, but you wouldn't need a UI, on, and you might not even want the UI on the same server. You might want the UI on a completely different server. So the UI might be running on the same server as the MySQL service. So uh, that's why there are separate components. Yeah. yeah. Question from Dan: How would this work with multiple Varnish instances, load bands? I think I just mentioned yeah. uh, answer that. Uh, Jonathan Lin, aside from timing, is there other types of information that Zipness is able to instrument? That's a good question. Um, currently, timing is the only the one, only one yeah. uh, but there's nothing really keeping up, uh, us back from adding more. Uh, basically, uh, we wanted to put Varnish, uh, Zipnish out there, uh, but uh, one, you could, for instance, uh, uh, if, if we add a header, we could call it X varnish annotations, uh, where your microservices could add all sorts of annotations. So, for instance, if you have a Java application, it might, for instance, in its response, uh, tell that it was hit by a garbage collection event during the response, which, which would then sort of, and then your ops team, if they see this weird trace where something that's supposed to take 50 milliseconds takes 750 milliseconds, but you see that there's an annotation that it was, this was hit by garbage collection, then that would be, of course, uh, explain that anomaly. Uh, might be... Yeah, but uh, still, this is, uh, this is also related to, uh, to timing. Uh, we've, we have only added timings because that was pretty much our main concern. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But but I mean, yeah. I think like the annotations would make sense, right? Uh, if you, for instance, if your application is also using memcache, you could include whether or not uh, memcache delivered a hit or a miss uh, on a specific service, and sort of these random uh, information snippets might actually sort of make sense. Annotations in the end will open the will open doors for any kind of information that you will be interested in. Yeah. A follow up from Dan. That's already been answered. Uh, another question from Sandeep. Does Varnish provide service registry functionality? Uh, no, it does not actually. Uh, so, of course, I think like I would guess that if you have a thousand microservices, that this architecture might not be ideal. Uh, at some point, it sort of might make sense to sort of. Uh, uh, do this in, in another way, uh, but I mean the service registry can easily be expressed in VCL. So if you have a service registry to sort of convert that or to have a little service that sort of outputs that in VCL form and sort of reloads Varnish on, on, on uh, uh, when there's an, a new event, should probably be quite simple. I mean, one of our other products, the, the Varnish API engine, basically is like one of the, the thing that it does is, is to provide you with a sort of service registry functionality. Uh, and it does that by generating VCL code. Uh, uh, comment from Edo Otus. Awesome, this is pretty much the architecture we're building our new API on, and it will definitely give it a try. Cheers. Yeah, well, excellent. <laughs> um, do you tell us if you need any help in these regards? Or yeah, yeah, I mean, currently this is a super friendly open source project <laughs> uh, because, like, uh, we are, uh, like, 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 we run some microservices, but they're really small and test-like. Uh, so I have built a microservice calculator. <laughs> you just seen um, uh, Marius's microservices. <laughs> Um, so what he uses microservices for, uh, uh, 
uh, we need somebody to to sort of uh, to to help guide us in in a direction and and to tell us what you want and what you need for, uh, from all of this. Uh, I didn't mention this, but uh, sort of uh, Zipnish itself is uh, under the same license as Vanish Cash, so it's a BSD license, so it's of course open source and free, um, with a, with a very 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 liberal license attached to it. So it's uh, yeah. It's open for anyone. So. Uh, oh, another question. Last, probably last, last question from Sandeep. If varnish is deployed and all service requests go through it, what will happen if the varnish process fails? Well, of course, then that those uh, service requests will fail. Uh, now, now, thankfully, sort of varnish is a pretty stable product. Uh, it crashes very seldomly. Uh, and even if it should crash, it will restart itself. Uh, so the downtime will be probably measured in uh, milliseconds or hundred or hundreds of a uh, hundredths of of, uh, of a second. Uh, so the, the, the downtime should be negligible. Yeah. Uh, besides, I mean, uh, so, so I mean, and and that's part of the thing that you're trying to leverage here is that you're leveraging all the effort that we spent over the last 10 years into making Varnish as robust as possible. And instead of you sort of pouring that same effort into each one of your microservices, you're adding Varnish basically and you get a whole lot of, of resiliency basically for free because you don't have to pour all that stuff into each one of your services. You can just sort of deploy Varnish and Varnish will sort of, yeah, uh, add a lot of, of resiliency to it. So uh, those are all the questions. Uh, it's about uh, two minutes to the hour, so uh, we're, we're spot on for for time. Uh, I would like to, to thank you all for uh, for showing up. I think even I have a, a slide here which says uh, a Q and A, uh, and thank you for your attention. Uh, so. Um, yeah, just Google Zipnish if you don't remember the URL. Uh, there's only pro one product that uh, that's named this. There's only one thing that's named Zipnish currently, so yeah, it should be not a problem finding it. Thank you, guys. Yeah, and please do use our GitHub uh, account for Zipnish. Come up with any kind of uh, input. We'll we actually welcome this. We're waiting for the, for for such input. Yeah. So yeah. if you have any questions, if you have any questions, you can also raise GitHub issues on them, and we'll be happy to answer them there. Great. Yeah. Thank Cheers. you all. Bye.